So in this lecture, I'm going to wrap up our overall discussion of time series models with one last topic, which is just a generalization of what we've been talking about before, which is uh, this idea of intervention analysis, which really I think fits well within this general theme of repeated measures. So what is an intervention analysis? An intervention analysis is where you have treatments as part of some experimental manipulations, those treatments uh, play out in time. And so, you know, this is actually, you know, a very common experimental design. I think it's a very powerful experimental design where you have some pretreatment data that establishes what are the differences between your measurement units, which is important because, you know, in everything we've been talking about up to now, you know, random effects on unit or autocorrelated errors on units, you know, there are often differences between our observational units that are just there by chance. Um, and so we can collect pre-treatment data to establish how we're different units different from each other before we impose our, uh, our experimental manipulation. And then our hypotheses are usually related to how one or more of the parameters in our model will change when we impose an experimental treatment. And with the null model being that there'd be no change in the parameters. You would start with a model for how things are different initially, and then we'd ask how experimental treatment is going to change uh, what we're seeing already. And this could be modeled in a, in a number of ways. Uh, time could be put in as an explicit covariate. Uh, you could put in the treatment as a as a covariate, you know, you know, uh, the pretreatment data does not have uh, the treatment imposed yet. And you can deal with it you know, um, through autocorrelation. So if you, if you made that uh, treatment implicit, so you know, maybe at time one and two was pretreatment gets a zero, time three, four, five, or post-treatment, so they get a one, uh, you would still need to deal with the autocorrelation and the errors uh, that, you know, uh, observations from a single observational unit are not independent from each other. So this figure just uh, gives a quick view of kind of some simple process models that one might think about implementing in this kind of framework of intervention analysis. So we have some pretreatment data and, you know, maybe pretreatment group A, treatment A group was already a little bit bigger than treatment than the control. And, you know, by having the pretreatment data, you can, you know, detect that and see that, you know, some of the difference between A and the control uh, was there already. It was not a reflection of the imposition of the treatment, but maybe we have, we impose our treatment and then we get, in this case, a step change, uh, an instantaneous response that continues through time. And so that's a fairly simple, uh, model to implement, you know, control is just constant, treatment is constant, and then switches to a different constant uh, when the uh, intervention is imposed. Uh, that said, not all uh, experimental manipulations pull out, play out that way. You know, maybe what you actually see is a, a you impose a treatment, you get a pulse response, and then a return back to normal or you know, a pulse up and then maybe an exponential decay back to normal. Or maybe you impose uh, an experimental treatment and you get a, a gradual divergence between the control and the treatment. So you have uh, you know, a, 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 um, uh, an experimental treatment that accumulates over time versus one that you know, has a, an immediate effect and that effect decays over time. Um, or maybe, you know, your control data was already showing a trend. And when you uh, impose the treatment, what you see is a, uh, a change in that trend. Or likewise, maybe the control already had a trend and then you saw a pulse response uh, that either went up or down or, or you know, decayed back. Uh, and, and you have to account for the fact that the control itself might need a process model describing its variability through time. Um, one important generalization of this idea of intervention models are, are what are called change point models or threshold detection models. 
these models are, are very much like our intervention process models, uh, but in, in an intervention process model, the point in time when the change occurs is known because it's imposed externally. Uh, in change point models or threshold detection models, um, there you, we observe a change in the dynamics of the system. Uh, and what we're trying to infer is uh, not just uh, that uh, things changed and how much they changed, but when the change actually occurred. So the point in time where there's a change in the parameters uh, is also a parameter that needs to be estimated. Uh, this is not impossible in maximum likelihood, but it can be more challenging in maximum likelihood because it actually causes there to be a discontinuity in the likelihood surface. And uh, most optimization methods do not deal with discontinuities in the likelihood easily. Um, so they, they can be really challenging for numerical optimization because of this kind of switching uh, behavior. Uh, it's not to say that it's simple in Bayes. You, you know, these models can be challenging to, con to converge because of those discontinuities, but uh, they're, they're, I would say, tend to be uh, better behaved and uh, and they're actually not that challenging to implement. So this last bit of code I want to go over is envisions how we might implement uh, a change point analysis. So here I'm going to assume that our process model is one of a linear trend. So we have time as our covariate and we're, our prediction of our mean has some intercept and some slope. And so we're just envisioning that uh, there's just some some trend over time, and we're just matter, in this case modeling as a function of time. Uh, and let's assume that this mu one with beta one uh, describes the trend in the model before the change. And then let's say after the change, we have some beta two, so we have a new intercept and new slope. So we have a vector of parameters beta one that describe uh, the, the linear trend before the change point, and we have a different linear trend after the change point. Uh, to be able to implement this, we'll need you know, a prior, a vector prior on betas, a vector prior on beta two. So two different priors for these two different uh, trends. Um, so it's fine if our prior expectations for them this, are the same. Uh, then we have to Im implement this change point itself. So the overall mean, mu, uh, is mu2 if i is bigger than k and mu1 otherwise. So we basically, we start off uh, before the change point k, we're following mu1, and after the change point k, we're following mu2. If this was an intervention model, uh, we would know k. We'd impose k as a known parameter. Uh, in a change point analysis, though, we don't know k. It's a parameter that needs to be estimated. And so it's a parameter that we need to put a prior on it. So in this case, we're going to use a categorical prior and assign a vector of probabilities for the different options uh, for when that change point occurs. Uh, and Typically, that might just be um, equal probability to all of the different uh, points in time. So if this has n points, this pi each might be 1 over n as a vector. Uh, that said, the, the categorical prior does allow uh, different probabilities. Um, we haven't seen this prior before, but it basically allows us to model uh, you know, discrete states occurring with uh, discrete probabilities. And then the, the rest of the model is the same as, as before. We have uh, some observed data normally distributed around whatever our model predicts with some precision. Um, and you could imagine taking this framework and implementing many of the different options that we saw before for change point responses. This is just a, a, a change in slopes model. 
you know, special cases, you know, if, if, if we had, if everything was constant before break, we might drop this initial slope. Um, if we just saw a step change in the intercepts, we might just see just a beta two and not two one and not have this beta two two. Uh, if we had some kind of decaying back, we might uh, need a more complex process model. It might have some sort of exponential component to it instead of a linear component. Uh, but yeah, this is a general framework. And uh, this idea of breakpoints is one that can be generalized. Uh, and indeed, it's theoretically possible to construct models with multiple uh, breakpoints, but you would have to, uh, like we did in the multinomial model, impose some structure uh, on the, the ordering of those breakpoints to keep them uh, in order. Uh, so you don't have one mixing it, uh, so, yeah, to get them to converge, they need to be kept in a discrete order. Um, and, you know, even beyond that, there's ways of doing things like reversible jump MCMC models that might actually treat the number of uh, change points as an unknown in a model. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll ramp, kind of, this kind of wraps up our, our discussion of time series models. And uh, after this, we're going to uh, move on to uh, spatial models, which are in many ways a, a very direct extension of what we've been doing in uh, time series models, but where we, instead of having uh, one dimension uh, where autocorrelation can occur on, we now have uh, two or more dimensions. Thanks.